Hello, good afternoon and welcome to UCL. Welcome to the Faculty of Medical Sciences and our public lecture series. Uh, today is a special event. We have um, one of the uh, biggest um, uh, experts in, in the topic of COVID. And uh, uh, we're going to be discussing the topic of breathing in COVID-19, the short and long-term impacts of COVID-19 on our lungs. This is definitely probably one of the hottest topics at the moment, and we really can't wait to hear uh, the lecture. So just before we start, um, uh, let me tell you a little bit about myself. I'm Dr. Neftali Marina Gonzalez. I'm the academic lead in the Integrated Medical Sciences programs. Uh, I lead uh, basically uh, seven undergraduate programs in the year one. And uh, I'm also a cardiovascular neuroscientist, and um, I'm really excited uh, to be here as your host of, of this series. Uh, as a quick announcement, we're going to be doing a very special event on the 9th of March that I would really uh, like to invite you, and hopefully you will be able to join us. Um, it, it's going to start at 4.30 p.m. Uh, UK time. It's going to be a student questions and questions and answer session. So basically, it's going to be a session with our undergraduate students, and you can actually find out from them uh, how they picked their course. So we have a number of courses in, in the Faculty of Medical Sciences, like I said, seven in particular, excluding the MBBS. Uh, which is the medical uh, career. And uh, you can hear from the students how they picked up their course, what they love about UCL, what their experience has been uh, dealing with uh, with the COVID uh, distance learning experience, and uh, what they wish they knew before they started uni. So I think this is going to be a unique opportunity for you to get to get uh, this experience uh, firsthand from students who are already enrolled in the in the programs okay so keep an eye out for, for more information we will update you and just put this in, the, in your calendars it's going to be on the 9th of march and without further ado it is my absolute pleasure to introduce professor joanna porter uh, um, she is the head of the nhs national interstitial uh, lung disease service at uclh and she's also a professor of respiratory medicine here in ucl her clinical interest is uh, in interstitial lung disease. It's a really horrible uh, condition in which pulmonary fibrosis uh, and ILD uh, 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 as in the context of autoimmune disorders. Um, and she's been really interested in the development of novel biomarkers and therapies. Uh, Professor Porter is one of the funding members as well uh, and medical director of uh, the charity called Breathing Matters. Uh, it's a very important uh, charity uh, that provides funding to, for the research of uh, breathing uh, pathologies. And she is also head of the undergraduate respiratory teaching at UCLH. So please um, help me to welcome Professor Joanna Porter. And at the end of the session, uh, where, uh, the, the lecture is about 20 to 30 minutes. Uh, please type your questions in the chat and and I will select the questions and I will read the questions to Professor Porter. So it, this is a unique opportunity for you to interact with a world expert and please uh, bring all the, uh, the the best questions and uh, that, that, that you can imagine. OK, thank you very much and I will see you in a bit. Professor Porter, thank you for thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you very much, Naftali, for your introduction. So as uh, Neftali has said in the introduction, I'm going to talk to you about COVID-19 and in particular the lungs, which we think are the organ that are most affected by COVID-19. But don't be fooled, COVID-19 has also been shown to affect other organs. We're going to look at the lungs acutely, what happens when you acutely develop COVID-19 and what are the long term consequences? So let me take you back a bit in my time machine and uh, it's hard to believe that um, it's only really a year since uh, COVID really uh, dismantled our lives. So let's just take a, a, a little look back at what happened when the SARS-CoV-2, which is the coronavirus that causes COVID-19, first appeared in the UK and in our consciousness. Um, so towards the end of January, we had already been hearing noises of a Chinese virus, a virus in China, 
uh, which had led to a devastating pneumonia at the end of 2019, hence its name COVID-19. Uh, and we felt, I don't know why we felt this, but we felt uh, relatively insulated from it. We didn't realise that the virus, uh, just like the humans um, that carried it, could quite easily jump on an aeroplane and, and move anywhere around the world. And in uh, towards the end of January, the first two cases of COVID-19 were recorded in the UK. Now, almost certainly looking back um, in time, almost certainly there were uh, cases of the, I'm just seeing if I've got a laser pointer, yeah, there were cases of COVID before these cases. The first confirmed death initially in the UK was first noted to be on the 5th of March, but in fact um, it had probably happened a few days early on the 2nd of March. But since that time it's become clear that there was a patient as early as um, the last week in January in the UK who died of COVID-19. So we're always sort of equilibrating, resetting the epidemiology of this disease. It's apparent it was in the UK probably earlier than we thought, maybe even as early as December 2019, but probably not much before then. And we, and we know that because if we look at CT scans and other images of patients who are under routine cancer care pathways, we have found some in which we picked up signs of COVID in the lung. These are asymptomatic patients, but we can't find many of those if we go back before December uh, 2019. So I don't think it was around that much sooner. The first um, British coronavirus death was, was thought to be the, one of the ones on the cruise ship that docked on the coast of Japan in February. But as I say, it's now apparent that there was an earlier death. And remember, in March of last year, there was an enormous political movement, uh, billions of pounds of emergency support to cope with the coronavirus, further billions of support for businesses to cope. We were advised to avoid pubs and restaurants and to work from home. And then on the 23rd of March, the Prime Minister placed the UK in lockdown and we were only allowed to leave our homes for limited reasons. Uh, and it's hard to believe that that um, that was uh, actually less than a year ago. So this is um, these are the cases in the UK and this is very, very small, but this takes us back to March um, 2020 and then to February 2021. So pretty much where we are now. And what you'll see in the green are the numbers of cases you can see up here. 10,000, 20,000, 30,000. Um, what you see is there were cases as we went through March and April. This is what we call the first peak. And you might be thinking to yourself, well, that's not very dramatic. There weren't so many patients then compared to what happened in subsequent peaks. But the truth of the matter is we were rather slow to get ourselves up doing the tests for coronavirus. And the test that we need to do, we need to actually find the virus in a swab from the oropharynx, so from the throat or from the nose. And this involves using a swab uh, with a special um, uh, substance that then stops the virus degrading before it can be shipped to a laboratory that can then look specifically for the RNA of the virus. Uh, and we didn't have much testing going on at the very beginning. So we had plenty of people with coronavirus, but they were never proven to be positive on this test. Subsequently, testing became more widespread, which is why we, we have more uh, we have more positive tests. So this is the first peak March and April, which died down in June, July, August, and then resurged again in September, October, probably as children went back to school. It, it's still really unclear who spreads the disease. Um, you'll see all sorts of people have been accused of spreading the disease. Uh, it usually is younger people. But having said that, there are many, many cases of people who've shielded, they've only been going out to the shops and they've still caught coronavirus, which makes us think that actually it's probably a slightly older population that are doing a lot of the spreading. That was our second peak and then uh, we had a third peak. And if we look at what happened to, in lock, with the lockdowns, here the red arrows, this is the first lockdown which started in March and then was relieved in June. Uh, and you can see actually this, the, the second lockdown did have an impact on the numbers of cases. And we are, of course, now in the third lockdown, which we're hoping to see an end of soon, because I think we're all getting a little bit stir crazy. Some really key points, and I hope you can see this. Um, the first 
uh, key event was remdesivir. Remdesivir is an antiviral agent. It stops the virus replicating. And that was approved by the NHS really quite soon after the pandemic started in the UK. We also, and I think this is a real tribute to um, the way our clinical trials were set up, it was decided very early on that instead of having lots of different trials of novel agents, we were going to have one national study and we were going to run um, drugs through this national study and we were going to put thousands of people into the study. And as soon as we got an answer as to whether a drug was reducing mortality or not, we would then move on to test other drugs. So we were able very quickly to have what we call an adaptive platform study where we could test drugs that we thought might be helpful to see if they really were. So we were able to test hydroxychloroquine, dexamethasone, um, aspirin, common drugs that we know are relatively safe to see if they impacted on the virus. And the one that came out very early on as being helpful was a very, very cheap, widely available drug, dexamethasone, which is a steroid. And it was found that in patients who needed oxygen, and we'll come on to that in a moment, if you gave them 10 days of six milligrams of dexamethasone, then you reduced their mortality. This only was a benefit in patients that required oxygen. So most of those would be patients who'd be admitted to hospital. Most patients in the community who didn't need oxygen would not benefit, and in fact, might even be harmed by this treatment. Of course, um, an amazing, amazing event was the approval of the Pfizer messenger RNA vaccine by the NHS, which really is extraordinary to have produced um, a vaccine that is so efficacious. I think many of you may have seen the data from Scotland showing that there's a 90% plus reduction in your risk of going to hospital after just one dose of either the Pfizer vaccine or as came a little bit later, the AstraZeneca or so-called Oxford vaccine. And more recently, just hot off the press really, is the finding from the recovery team again, so from this big platform study, that if you use a drug which neutralizes an inflammatory cytokine, which we'll be talking about in a moment, um, anti-IL-6, so this is a drug called tocilizumab, uh, then again, that reduced mortality in patients who were very unwell with hyperinflammation. But this picture, the, the, the problem with relying on numbers of proven cases um, of COVID, as we have done here, so these are cases that test positive, is you may not be catching as uh, all the cases. So another way we look at it is the number of deaths from COVID. And you can see actually here, again, I've shown you the first wave, the second wave, the third wave. What the astute of you will notice here is that they're sort of great dips. And this is at the weekend where when we're apparently not very good at reporting. It's not that COVID doesn't work or doesn't kill people at the weekend. Um, it's just that we're not very good at reporting. So the reporting tends to be done sort of during the week and then um, uh, the sort of backlog. And what you'll see is that the deaths actually are, are, are probably relatively similar between the, the first and the second wave. And there's been a lot of talk about excess deaths. So just very quickly to go through this, the red are the weekly accumulated deaths from COVID going from January 9, um, 2020 through to January 21. And you'll see the deaths from COVID in red. You'll see actually the normal expected deaths from influenza and pneumonia in blue. We always have um, many deaths actually in the winter months. And then what we'll see are the excess deaths, which are shown here in yellow. So plenty of excess deaths, which we think are uh, due to COVID. So let's go on and work out a little bit more about what COVID is getting up to. So I'm afraid I'm going to take you right back to anatomy because anatomy is the key to everything. So the lungs, uh, the most important function of the lungs is for gas exchange, for oxygen to come out of the air into the blood and for carbon dioxide, the waste gas to come out of the blood into the lungs so that it can be blown out of the lungs. So the lungs are a series of tubes which are designed for rapidly bringing in huge volumes of air into and out of the alveolar space, these spaces here. And it's in these spaces here that the gas exchange takes place. So the airways really just have to bring in um, the, the air. So they're lined by this tall, we call it a pseudostratified columnar epithelium, essentially a thick protective wall. Uh, which warms the air and brings it through to the space where gas exchange takes place. 
And this airspace, each of these little balls opens up and it's lined by a sphere of these flat cells. And in very, very close proximity to this little rounder circle here is a blood vessel. So gas exchange takes place from the air to the blood vessel and carbon dioxide from the blood vessel to the air. So you can see just this very thin strip is where the gas exchange takes place. But it's also what separates you, um, your bloodstream, from the outside world. So it's a very, very, very uh, vulnerable part of the body, actually. And if we look at it sort of in close up, here's the airspace. Uh, this is the type 2 alveolar cell, which really gives rise to these smaller cells that line the airspace. So if one of these cells gets damaged, it's rapidly replaced by a new cell produced by the parent cell, the type 2 alveolar cell. So the type 2 alveolar cell is keeping this alveolar space intact. There's a macrophage, which is a white blood cell who acts as a policeman. He patrols this space and makes sure that no pathogens are um, coming in. So no viruses, no bacteria. And then this just shows the capillaries with the red blood cells across which the gas exchange will take place. And here, if we look at an electron micrograph, we can see that the distance between the airspace here, labelled A, and the capillary here is actually just a couple of uh, point, points a micron. So it's actually one three hundredth of the width of a human hair, that, that space against which gas exchange takes place. So it's very clear that this is a very, very important part of our lungs. It's very important to keep these distances small as possible for gas exchange to take place. But the virus has a predilection for this bit of the lung. And here we can see a coronavirus particularly fond of these type 2 alveolar cells. And it's here that these cells that get infected by the virus when we inhale it. The virus can also infect the small blood vessels around the alveolar space. And so you can see that they can set up a lot of destruction in this very important part of the lung. And they can even infect that policeman, the macrophage, to make sure that um, the, the immune response is not uh, impeding their growth. So these viruses, and they're called coronaviruses because they have a crown-like structure which allows them to bind this key receptor on the alveolar epithelial cell. So here, the, the virus is binding the ACE2 receptor and it actually gets the cell, the human cell, to help it get in. So the human cell has an enzyme which allows the spike on the coronavirus to really interact well with this receptor on the cell surface and then be taken up into the cell surface. So it's like a Trojan horse. It gets taken up by the alveolar epithelial cell in the lung and then it uses the cell's machinery, the, the cellular factory, to build more and more and more viruses and to spew them out. So this, it turns your body into a factory to produce more and more virus to propagate. I mean, really, really clever. It's got a little niche here. And it tries to do this without killing too many cells, but the idea is that it now is able to spread to your next door neighbor. And you'll give it to your next door neighbor essentially by coughing or sneezing at them. And some of these droplets will land in their nose, will replicate in their nasal epithelium, and then make their way down into their lungs in many cases. How can we stop infecting each other? Well, a mask is very, very effective. So here's some pictures you'll see of people talking or coughing, or look at this one, sneezing. And I always thought sneezing sort of came from your nose, but actually, Sneezing is a really good way to cause these very, very small particles that spread uh, probably about 25, 30 centimetres or maybe even further. This is someone with no mask and you can see even a one layer cloth covering makes a bit of a difference. A two layer cloth covering makes a dramatic difference. Look at this now, sneezing through two layers, very few particles. And a surgical mask actually is better than any amount of uh, any, any cloth covering. So I think this is a beautiful example of, of why mask wearing is very good for your neighbours. It may not protect you so much, but it does protect your neighbours. One way it protects you, though, is if you were to pick up virus that had been spread by someone coughing or sneezing on a surface and then to touch your nose and face, you might 
um, transmit the virus to yourself, whereas a mask actually stops you touching your face so much. And there's new evidence as well that wearing glasses actually reduces your chances of getting an infection by about um, down to about a third. And so I'm very quickly going to sort of go through this. This is uh, the picture that we've already seen of the lung. This is the cell that gets infected first, and it means that it's unable now to, to replicate and make these covering if needed for the rest of the lung. This is the normal situation. And during SARS-CoV-2, we've already seen that it infects the type 2 cells. But it also not only infects the macrophages, but drives them through specific receptors to produce cytokines. The macrophages, as I've said, are the policemen of the alveolar space. And if they sense damage or viruses, they will throw out um, distress signals. And the distress signals will tell white blood cells such as neutrophils that are trafficking close to the lung in the blood vessels to leave the blood vessel, come into the lung and fight the pathogen. Now, you need some neutrophils to clear pathogens, but too many neutrophils in the wrong place and too much neutrophil activation in the wrong place can lead to mayhem. Uh, and in particular, can lead to local blood clot formation um, and also damage to the cells around the alveolar space and also an introduction of fluid into the alveolar space. So suddenly this beautiful system of air and blood and gas exchange becomes a fluid filled bit of the lung, which now can't get involved in gas exchange and a, um, a circulatory system, which is now prone to blood clots and cellular death. And we see a lot of blood clots in patients with COVID-19. And we see a lot of so-called pneumonitis, this cellular infiltration of the lungs. This is a normal chest x-ray. Chest x-ray is a very, very good ways of looking at the alveolus. The alveolus is full with air and on a chest x-ray air is black. So black is very, very good. So these lungs are beautiful, healthy lungs full of air. The white bit in the middle is the heart that's supposed to be there. And, and some of the streaks are just the blood vessels um, that are moving between these air filled spaces. And this is very early and actually not so severe SARS-CoV-2 pneumonitis. You can see patches of alveolar space now filled with white, which is fluid. So this is the interstitial fluid, um, which has developed in patches throughout the lungs. And this is a classic finding of an early pneumonitis case. And this patient will be developing a cough, which is a cardinal sign of lung disease, but also shortness of breath as they struggle to continue gas exchange whilst the lungs are filled with fluid. And what we see actually is that when you first get infected with SARS-CoV-2, you'll go through a pre-symptomatic phase, but the virus at this stage is replicating wildly. It's switched on all your all the machinery it can of the host to churn out more and more virus. Um, and you might be feeling great at this point. And this is when you are at your most dangerous, believe me. This is where you will be coughing virus at your friends, but you'll be telling everyone you feel fine. So of course we can go uh, and meet up for a, a drink in the pub, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, you won't have a temperature, you won't have any symptoms, you'll feel as right as rain. And then gradually, after about five days, at peak viral production, you may start to feel a bit unwell with aching muscles, sore throat, perhaps you may remain asymptomatic. It's, it's obvious that there are a lot of cases of completely asymptomatic disease. But in some cases, instead of at about day four or five starting to feel a bit better, um, this is a uh, um, the sort of normal course of events so that by 10 days you're back to normal. What we find is that some patients develop a progressive severe disease at about eight to 12 days and this can become critical. And what we know is that we can't really blame the virus here because the virus is now being dealt with. The virus is being reduced in number and you may not even have a positive COVID test at this point. But what has happened is your body has gone into overdrive. And in particular, the policemen, the macrophages patrolling the lungs 
have started to produce uh, cytokines and are causing an inflammatory response. That is what is killing you. This explains actually why um, the dexamethasone maybe is helping. It's helping in the patients with the more severe illness that need oxygen because it's dampening down their immune response. Uh, and in many ways, um, that many of the problems with COVID are that overactive immune response. Here you can see your antibody levels picking up. And if you survive this critical illness, you will have high antibody levels and we think that those will be protective to some extent uh, to prevent you getting further disease. So what do we know then of the patients of um, if you were to get uh, catch the SARS-CoV-2 virus and get COVID-19 infection? And actually, this is a really difficult question to know exactly how many people um, do badly if they get the virus. And I'll explain why it's so complicated. It's because there are two things to consider. One is the infection fatality ratio or the IFR. And this tells us the number of deaths among all infected people. So that's taking everybody who's got the virus and how many of them die. And the problem is we don't really have a very, very excellent gold standard um, to detect the virus. We could do, and we have done in certain places, repeated swabs and PCR testing um, but actually managing to do that on large scale is very difficult. So we probably do miss people. So what we tend to look at is the case fatality ratio. And this estimates the proportion of deaths amongst those that are identified as confirmed cases. So these are looking at all the people who have a positive PCR test and how many of those die. And you probably slightly overestimate the mortality. But looking at the CFR, it's estimated um, sorry, looking at the IFR, uh, Imperial College produced some data at the end of last year saying that they thought in this country the infection fatality ratio was about 1%. Uh, it's a little bit lower in younger people and a little bit higher in older people. And they felt that this was similar throughout wealthy countries. If you go to poorer countries, the average age is less, uh, there is less obesity, um, the IFR is actually much lower. And this compares with the flu IFR, which actually is substantially high, really, for a disease that's widespread. But, but SARS-CoV-2 is clearly much higher. So what we can say, I think, and this changes um, as we get more and more information, but of 100 people with SARS-CoV-2 infection, about 92 will have mild disease, 92%. 8% will require hospital admission. And of these, 2%, I'm sorry, 1 in 4, so 2% of the total, will require intensive care. So they will require to be on a unit where they have um, uh, they are ventilated either by a very tight fitting mask or if they're very unwell, they're actually um, put into a, a sleep like state and they have a tube put down into their lungs for the oxygen to be to be put through. And about one or two patients will die. So so this is the one point one five percent. And unfortunately, you're more likely to die if you're older. Um, if you're male and if you have other diseases. So, those are the patients, those are the patients that have the acute pulmonary inflammation infection. But then what we're also seeing, uh, and there's been a lot of concern, is will COVID infection itself actually set off in your lungs a process by which you develop scarred lungs and will this then continue even after you've got rid of the virus? And you will say, well, why on earth would you think that? And the reason we think that is that there are other coronaviruses that have um, we've looked at. So um, MERS and SARS-CoV-1 that have been shown even after you recover from the initial illness, you may develop a fibrotic scarring lung disease. And even if this only happens in a small percentage of people, the fact is that the numbers of people involved uh, in this pandemic are so enormous that even a small percentage getting a fibrotic scar in lung disease will be a large group of people. So there's been a lot of interest in following up patients after they've left hospital. And now, as you can imagine, we've got some patients we've been following up um, for almost a year. 
But here was some, some nice data from Austria, and I think this is the best sort of comprehensive data I've seen so far, but there is plenty more data coming. And what this group did in Austria is they followed up all their patients. They did a comprehensive prospective. So they decided at the beginning they were going to follow them up and then they followed them up. They didn't find the patients and look back at what had happened to them. They picked them up at the beginning of their journey and followed them through. Uh, they followed these patients from April to June 2020 and they are still following them. And after they had been discharged from hospital having had COVID, they followed them up at 6, 12 and 24 weeks. And they examined the patients, did some blood tests, measured their oxygen, measured how their lungs worked, did a scan of the lungs and did a test of the heart. And they followed up 86 patients, which is just a tiny amount of, of patients. Most of these were male, so they were 65% male, 35% female. Um, almost half of them had been smokers and about 20% had had to go to intensive care. So these were 20% of them were really quite unwell and they'd been in hospital for an average of 13 days. So although 20% were very unwell, 80% of them actually were not too unwell. They were the sort of patients that we see um, in the general wards of the hospital. And they looked at them, um, as I said, at six weeks, they asked them if they felt short of breath. And what was extraordinary is that nearly 50% of them, so nearly half of the patients, 47% said they felt short of breath. And in particular, they asked if they felt profoundly short of breath, which is what this modified MRC scale three to four means. This is like very, very short of breath. About 10% of them were very, very short of breath um, and 15% of them had a cough. So these are patients at six weeks, we would expect most patients to be better after a viral illness. So when they brought them back at 12 weeks, amazingly, still 40% of them had some sort of shortness of breath and 15% of them were coughing. And what we found, what, 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 what the group found, is that even at 12 weeks, 20% had abnormal lung function and 22% had this abnormality in gas exchange. So even though they had recovered, 12 weeks on, which is three months, these patients were still very short of breath. And this is something that has been replicated all over the world actually, is that patients post COVID appear to have persistent fatigue, shortness of breath, and in some cases cough, which is very, very hard to shake off. And it, in general, I would say from our experience at UCLH, it certainly does get better in the majority of people, but it can take seven to eight months. So just to summarise what they found, they, they did their prospective follow up. 50% of patients had lung abnormalities at 12 weeks and 40% were still suffering from breathlessness. But patients did improve. And I think what I would say is that is what we're seeing. We're seeing that patients are improving. Do we know why these changes persist? We think it is all back to the intense inflammation at the beginning. It doesn't seem to matter if you were on uh, in hospital and needed oxygen, or, e or if you were in the community with regular to not needing oxygen COVID, um, you may still suffer from these symptoms. And if the symptoms, if we can find no sort of obvious explanation for the symptoms, then that sort of fulfills the criteria for long COVID. Now, one thing, um, that we're all very excited about the vaccines. And I just wanted to really touch on the new variants. And the new variants have changes in their crown-like spikes, which may affect how they spread, and may affect what happens to people who are infected with these new variants, although we haven't really found a difference in lung disease amongst the variants, um, and may also affect vaccine efficacy. So at the moment, we have um, the Pfizer-BioNTech um, mRNA vaccine, the Oxford-AstraZeneca adenoviral vaccine, the Moderna vaccine and the Novavax, and actually I think there are a couple more. There are multiple variants of the virus that are circulating globally. Uh, there's the Kent variant, which originated in the UK in autumn 2020. It was called variant um, of concern, and this stands for 12201 is December 2020 slash um, 01, the first. And it apparently spreads more easily and quickly and there was a suggestion in January that there was an increased risk of death for older people from this variant. 
You'll have heard of the South African variant, which has a couple of different names, and that emerged absolutely independently of the UK variant, but shares some mutations. And I think this is really interesting, and this is what's worrying people, is the viruses are mutating independently, but many of them are picking up this E484K mutation. Uh, and the reason that is so important is it may affect the binding by antibodies generated by the vaccines. So the South African variant, we've, we do have over 100 cases in the UK of this variant. And in Brazil, another variant, um, again, with additional mutations that may affect its ability to be recognized by the antibodies that are generated, not just by the vaccine, but maybe also by the natural infection. And then hot off the press, we have another UK variant announced um, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, which is the variant of concern 2020-1201. So all, um, all of these variants, as I say, have expressed the E, have been found to express the E484K mutation. They do seem to spread more easily, more quickly than other vaccines, and they may lead to more cases of COVID-19. The UK government has set up in January a new variant assessment platform to offer genomics advice to resource poor countries that, that actually are unable to test for all these viruses. Because obviously, when we test for the virus, we don't necessarily look for mutations, um, although now it is becoming more and more common to look for mutations um, or particularly markers such as the S gene target failure marker, which um, is a very good indicator of this new variant, even though um, it, it isn't absolutely a, a test of the, the gene that's varied. It's a sort of surrogate marker. So more, more about the variants will, will be coming apparent. So just to summarize what we've talked about, so SARS-CoV-2 is a novel coronavirus. Um, it, 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 it has not been experienced before and it's responsible for the disease COVID-19. The initial infection is in the nose and upper airways um, and it spreads very easily from person to person because of this. Infection can result, it doesn't always, but it can result in pneumonitis and endothelitis, which is inflammation of the blood vessels. Uh, and actually, it's this endothelitis which explains why SARS-CoV-2 can affect really any organ in the body, because every organ in the body has a blood supply. It's really apparent that the host immune response augments injury and may respond to immunosuppressive treatments such as corticosteroids, such as dexamethasone, or anti-cytokine therapies such as tocilizumab, which is an anti-interleukin-6 therapy. Fatality is around 1% and is highest among the elderly, but it, the excess deaths are highest in the young. Uh, although, a lot of, uh, although a lot of elderly people die, it's actually, and I think we all know this from the newspapers, the shock is when a fit young person gets COVID and dies. And many patients will feel fatigue and shorter breath for weeks after the infection. Some patients are left with long term lung damage, but I think in our estimates, we are and, and, and there have been estimates from ourselves, from St. Bartholomew's Hospital, from St. George's Hospital. It's probably somewhere between four to eight percent of patients who will be left with long term lung damage. And what is apparent is that in most cases that will continue to improve rather than continue to get worse. Vaccination is a real game changer, but escape mutants may be being selected for and immunization strategies will have to keep ahead of that. And we know that um, the messenger RNA vaccines actually are very adaptable for being um, rejigged and new vaccines being produced so that uh, we can keep one step ahead of the variants. So thank you very much. And I think there's now some time for questions. Thank you very much, Professor Porter. That was a really amazing um, presentation and um, we have uh, approximately 510 uh, participants which is a record level of uh, of students uh, thank you all for joining us i know it's a bit late for all of you but uh, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, this is definitely a very special occasion we have quite a few questions for you uh, more than 150 so i'm gonna yeah. uh, <laughs> make every effort like uh, to 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 probably uh, select the most relevant ones and the, uh, the most popular ones. So hopefully we'll have time to uh, to go through quite a few. So first question, uh, can we talk about the mental health impact uh, COVID has had on people? So this seems to be a very popular matter of concern. 
Oh my goodness, yes. I mean, we could we well we could we could talk for the whole uh, probably for the rest of the year on the mental health impact. I think we all have have felt some mental health impact. I think the impact on patients um, who have diseases, chronic diseases um, that are not COVID, but are having to um, miss hospital appointments or have delays in treatment. Um, and then the mental health impact of those who have COVID, where I think being um, diagnosed with the disease and, and being told that it's a new disease and we don't really know what's going to happen is, is terrifying. One, one piece of work that came out of the Royal Free Hospital really beautiful piece of work. Um, they looked at patients who came, um, who were discharged from the hospital with COVID. Um, so these were sicker patients who'd been on oxygen, who had, who were older, who had different things wrong. And they looked at patients who'd been discharged from the emergency services department, who were in general younger, didn't need oxygen. And they found the same level of anxiety and mental health in both those groups of patients, independent of disease severity, which I think is telling us something. Mm, yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, next question. Why do some people say that the AstraZeneca vaccine is not effective for the South African variant? Is, it, is this true? Well, the, certainly the, the, the problem is that it's very hard to know if a, a vaccine is successful unless you immunise people and then discover it's not successful. So people use surrogate markers rather than the true gold standard, which is um, ability to prevent infections. So uh, what many people will do will look at serum generated in response to the vaccine and look at how it neutralizes the virus. But of course, that's only looking at one part of the immune response, which are the B cells and the antibodies they produce. It completely ignores the T cells and their response. So I think a lot of the discussion is because um, serum from patients that are immunized does not neutralize uh, in a laboratory experimental situation, does not neutralize the South African variant as well as um, it will neutralize other variants. It will still neutralize it, but I think it's only about a third as effective. And I think that's what this is based on. Mm, yeah, OK. Somebody's asking uh, something very interesting, which I, I find fascinating, the silent hypoxemia uh, phenomenon. So for those of you who don't know, patients who uh, develop low oxygen levels uh, without the typical symptoms of hypoxia. So is this true? And um, what could be the cause of that? Yeah, absolutely. It is true. It's called, it's sort of happy hypoxia or silent hypoxia. Um, and patients really don't feel distressed by the low oxygen levels. And we have not adequately explained that. It is widespread. It's not just a handful of patients. It's really quite common that patients um, just don't feel that bothered by the low oxygen. And it is probably an impact on the neurological, the autonomic, the sympathetic nervous system. But I've not seen a good explanation for it. So excellent question. Sorry, mm. can't answer it. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, uh, I, my, my research field is, is pretty much uh, in chemo reception and we, we just have absolutely no idea of what is going on. So it's, but it's definitely up to the, the new generations of scientists, probably uh, or the students who are attending this lecture. If, definitely. Uh, if we have a, a huge selection of medical sciences programs and uh, it's probably up to you to discover the 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 truth about this phenomenon. Uh, next question, um, what are the main reasons why men tend to have a bigger mortality rate? Yeah, another great question. It, probably because of the increased cardiovascular risk anyway amongst men. Um, but again, you'll say to me, well, why, why is that? Um, and I was always taught but I, but that, that women probably are protected a little bit, at least until they reach the menopause by estrogens. But I think um, that is our understanding is it is your risk it is very similar to um, cardiovascular risk factors. So diabetes, obesity and being male, I'm afraid, is just one of those things. It, it puts you at bigger risk of cardiovascular disease. Mm, yeah, exactly. That's true. How long uh, do uh, COVID-19 antibodies last? Do, do we have any Yeah, that's a great process? question. Mm -hmm. So so you make antibodies um, to all parts of the virus, so to the spike, to the nuclear protein. The ones that we measure are the ones to the spike protein, and they probably do decline relatively quickly, um, four to six months possibly. What's clear though is that antibodies to the nuclear protein part 
probably stay a bit longer. And if we measured those, we may find that even after your spike proteins, are de um, spike antibodies are undetectable, that you did still have some nuclear protein antibodies. So it depends a little bit how long you measure them. Um, and, and also, if you can no longer measure them, does that mean that the B cells that produce them aren't around and can't produce them anymore? I mean, I think we, we still don't really know what what it means, but we feel it must be a good thing to have high antibody levels. Mm, yeah, that's true. And somebody else asking, when you get a vaccine, can you still spread COVID-19? No, yeah, great question. <laughs> great question. I mean, you'd like to think not. And the general biological plausibility is that um, it that some people who were symptomatic will become asymptomatic but anyone who was asymptomatic may actually not have the disease at all. So everyone moves down a notch. And um, so there's probably the same, there probably will be spread from the asymptomatic ones, but we would suspect that it's not as high as if you were not vaccinated. But but the jury's still out on that, I have to say, that it, it's not clear. Mm, yeah, a very uh, a specialized question in a way, Sean is asking, what is the common characteristic of VQ mismatching within SARS-CoV-2 patients with moderate to severe ARDS? Um, what treatments can reverse the VQ mismatch in such a unique scenario of restrictive disease? Yeah, I. <laughs> so we think, I mean, almost certainly there will be VQ mismatch um, because there usually is, and that probably explains some of the hypoxia. Um, I know that our intensive care units, have, they try the, the treatments that they would normally use in ARDS from other causes. So they they use um, the, the vasodilators, nitric oxides. They do use steroids. Um, the jury is really out as to whether any of these work, um, whether the ARDS from SARS-CoV-2 is different from the ARDS from other diseases. So I'm afraid I'm probably not able to answer that question as expertly as the um, questioner would like, but it's an interesting question. Mm, yeah, that's true. Uh, you, you definitely touched on this, but uh, this is definitely a concern for a lot of people. Is fibrosis due to COVID reversible over time and can it be treated? Uh, probably it's a bit too early yet, but uh, as an expert in fibrosis, what, what, what do you reckon? Yeah, there was a lot of um, excitement and interest that we should be using some of the antifibrotic agents. So we there are drugs, there's a drug called perfenidone, um, which was actually developed as an anti-helminthic drug. And there's a drug called nintednib, which is a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. Uh, these will slow down the progression of fibrotic change. They won't reverse the fibrotic change, they will just slow it down. But I would say as yet, we have seen no evidence of progressive fibrosis post-COVID. Um, we, we, yeah, we've seen one or two patients, those ones with progressive fibrosis probably had an undiagnosed fibrotic lung disease before they had COVID and COVID then exposed it. But I think purely from COVID, we haven't seen progressive fibrosis. Mm. Okay, yeah. Uh, another very relevant question because definitely there's a lot of people being shielded, especially people with asthma. So how would somebody with asthma be more suscept susceptible to getting severe COVID uh, in, than compared to somebody without asthma? What, what, what is so special? Yeah, I, I suspect I suspect part of that, and I and I have to confess, I don't really know um, the asthma story. I think the asthma story is complicated. Asthma is an airways disease. SARS-CoV-2 is very much a sort of nasal um, alveolar disease. It, it, the, the issue is, I suppose, that if you have one virus, you may be more prone also to develop, to, to catch another virus. Um, if you have issues with your breathing, and this is just another insult. Uh, but of course, there's the wonderful story that's coming out of Oxford that actually the inhaled corticosteroids that asthma patients use on a regular basis may actually stop you getting some of the severe manifestations of COVID, presumably because it dampens down the immune response in the lungs. So I, I feel the the literature and the thoughts about asthma are a little bit, um, I would say confusing actually. So, and I and I would hate to comment on that because I'm not an asthma expert. Mm, yeah, yeah, that's true. 
Uh, somebody is asking about nitric oxide as a treatment for COVID-19. Uh, is it uh, likely to become available in the UK and how effective is it as a treatment, nitric oxide? So I think this goes back to the VQ mismatch. It's certainly nitric oxide or um, that, that allows sort of vasodilatation and changes in VQ mismatch. And again, that's an expertise beyond me, I'm afraid. You'll have to get an intensive care I think that's what that's alluding to. I don't I don't think of any other. I don't know of any other uses of nitric oxide, um, mm. nitrous oxide. Yeah. Okay. And uh, somebody's asking about uh, cyan uh, about extracorporeal um, machines. Um, uh, is it worth investing? Uh, so wh why in the UK we have so very few basically? Oh, gosh. And, and is it worth investing and training more into? Are they actually? Uh, useful to treat yeah. patients uh, yeah. who become uh, refractory to traditional treatment. Yeah. yeah, and I mean another excellent question. We do have some ECMO um, sites, uh, but certainly they're usually, um, and it is a way of oxygenating the blood without sort of bypassing the lungs. You essentially take the blood um, from the body, pass it through a, a sort of fake lung and then back into the body again so the lungs get completely rested. Um, it's it's rather hazardous as you can imagine um, and it's not available, um, it, it's only available in very very specialist centres and I think the health economics of it is probably very complicated so um, maybe for highly selected young people um, I'm sure it's of a benefit and certainly there are a lot of uh, patients probably still on ECMO at the moment from the second wave of COVID. Mm, yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, this is really interesting as well. Are there any therapies which have proven useful against long COVID? Mm. Long COVID is definitely a very, very yeah. Yeah. worrying problem. Yeah, I, I'm not aware of any. I mean, there's some, but, but to be honest, there haven't really been any studies as far as I'm aware in long COVID. There is talk of, of some studies and I'm sure we'll look at the usual sub, uh, suspects like, um, for example, the use of prednisolone. We, we do know that prednisolone can be helpful in um, some patients who continue to have inflammatory lung disease weeks after um, leaving hospital. And we do sometimes give those extra long or extra high doses of steroids, but I don't know of any other treatments. Um, yeah. And those could be either drug treatments or physical treatments, actually, whether and it, it may be that some sort of rehabilitation or exercise program or vitamins or dietary um, changes will be helpful. But I'm not aware of any that have been shown to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. OK, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, is it true that BAME minorities uh, are more susceptible to COVID-19? So that'll be a uh, black and Asian minorities. Yeah, I, I think I think that is true. There was a bit of discussion as to whether um, it was it was to, to do with socioeconomic status or, or jobs or employment. But I think actually there probably is a genetic susceptibility um, to COVID. So there are certain groups or even certain families that are more prone to COVID because of their genetic makeup. Mm, yeah. Uh, and what about the long term impacts of COVID on organs, on other organs like uh, the brain, probably vascular, cardiovascular system? Yeah. 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 Interestingly, I think um, there's been a, a bit of work looking at hearts in patients who were, in, in fact, in healthcare workers who never had severe COVID, so they weren't hospitalized. Um, and you do find cardiac abnormalities, but, but actually, you find cardiac abnormalities when you look at the control group as well. And it's not clear that these are actually that significant. So although you find them, they do get better. What's more profound is some of the cardiac abnormalities of patients who were acutely unwell with COVID. And in those patients, we see um, heart involvement. We do see brain involvement. There was an excess of strokes, confusion, delirium, epilepsy amongst patients with COVID. And we also see, of course, if patients are on intensive care for a long time, we see the muscle wasting, the neurological wasting that comes with not using your muscles and your limbs for a long time and having to relearn how to walk again. Mm, yeah, that's really dramatic. Um, 
And do we know of any factors uh, that increase the risk of permanent or long term COVID uh, damage? Is, is there any kind of um, risk yeah, factors? That's, that's a really good question. And I think um, there are studies. So there's the um, there's the, the PHOSP, that's the post hospitalization COVID study, which is looking at patients who are hospitalized with COVID and trying to work out who does well and who doesn't and tracing that back to the genes the initial, you know, the genetic makeup of the patient, the initial inflammatory response, the initial hospital uh, response. And then other people are doing this now in the community, big, big grants to look at outcomes in the community. So I think we will get some of those answers, but we don't have them yet. Mm. Uh, there's a lot of questions about the lockdown um, and that the roadmap uh, out of the lockdown. Uh, would you be able to comment on something like that? Do you think we're finally going to see the end, of the light at the end of the tunnel? Uh, so, probably this year. Yeah. So my my friends who know um, more about more about this tell me that there will be a third wave. Uh, well, for some for some places a fourth wave, another wave after this one. Um, because at the moment, um, we probably within each wave, maybe 10% of the population has been infected and is therefore resistant to infection or has some sort of immunity. And we've now vaccinated a lot of the over 70s. So, so probably the key people um, in the next wave will be the 40 to 60 year olds who aren't immunized, who haven't had it previously. Uh, so and we're hoping it will be a smaller wave, but almost certainly I'm told um, that, that there will be a third wave. I, I don't feel expert enough to comment, but. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult to know. Well, uh, I think that was the last question. Uh, uh, like I said, we have a lot of questions and, and uh, we're pretty much running out of time. So all I can do for now is thank you so much for joining us today and giving us this really interesting lecture for uh, participating with the the student community and answering their questions. Thank you everyone for, for coming tonight and, and, and attending the lecture. Um, like I said, uh, please um, feel free to look into the Faculty of Medical Sciences programs. We offer an MBBS medical degree and seven uh, medical sciences programs, which uh, will make sure that you become the next leader uh, scientist mm -hmm. who might be able to give us the answers to all the questions we couldn't answer today. So, so uh, maybe it's your turn in the future to get this information. And in the meantime, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, remember, there's another session on the 9th of March. It'll be great if you could all join us. And thanks everyone for coming and good luck. See you in the next lecture. Thank you. Thank you everyone for coming and the great questions. Thank you, Naftali. Thank you. Thank you, Joanna.